So if you uh, are headed up Highway 75 and you're going up Galena Pass and you get to the top and turn around and come back down, uh, just around about the second or third corner, we are looking at one of the first snows that Sherry snapped a picture of uh, here. That's probably uh, about a year and a half ago. And uh, just those clouds to me are so beautiful you could almost reach out and touch them. So thank you, Sherry, for that beautiful picture. And uh, in fact, the theme uh, are mountain pictures on this presentation. I hope you enjoy the last one as well. So uh, as you know, we call this Revelation a book for now immediately. Uh, I want you to know that when we do the book of Revelation, that God is sharing with John how he thinks and how he sees the things in this world. Specifically today, how does he see governments? How does he see religion? And so we're going to spend some time on that. Uh, it is also the word of God. It's his authority that he speaks with. So God's word is self-fulfilling. It does not need my help or your help to make it fulfilled. Everything God said is self-fulfilling from God's power and comes into being. We have the entire biblical history to see the evidence of that. And thirdly, that in the book of Revelation, God is trying to tell you that he is on your side. So today we're going to review briefly from chapter 13, and we're going to see how it ties in in the introduction to chapter 14. This is not chapter 14. That will be our next presentation, and we will look at the uh, first part of that in our next presentation. So I do hope you enjoy our study today. So we're going to contrast between the mark of the beast and the seal of God. We had a lot of conversation about it. So many people have so many things. They talk about inserting chips in you. They talk about, I mean, I've heard tattoos. I'm hearing young people today, Christian young people, say, well, I'm afraid to wear the mask because I don't want to receive the mark of the beast. I'm going to dispel that myth today that the mark of the beast is yet to come into play. Okay? So, I hope that's helpful to you, but we do want to contrast what is the difference between receiving the mark of the beast and what does the seal of God consist of? What does it look like? So, on this slide, I have four things. Just in the red, I just read to you. The mark or seal, the next point, defines who you worship or who you are loyal to. That is the second point. Revelation says the mark or seal determines who it is that owns your heart. Does the beast own your heart or does God own your heart? Notice Matthew 6 verse 24. No one can serve two masters for he will either hate one or love the other. He will be devoted to one and despise the other. There's no such thing as sitting on the fence. You know, when you, you, you go and watch a football game or track or whatever, an event, you sit as someone sitting up watching in the bleachers the event unfold. The book of Revelation says you are the one that is out on the field here. You are the one in the game. And you are either on God's side or you are on the opposition side. That would be the beast. Okay, let's move on. So when we understand the two master conflict, you can't serve both. Jesus makes that very clear. The beast comes into existence. Listen carefully. When Christians unite with civil power to legislate for a greater nation, to make the nation great, and to make the world a better and more moral place, if there's such more moral, uh, to make the world follow God's morality through legislation. Now, if you read chapter 13 carefully, the beast power unites the whole earth. So it isn't just about America. This is a global story that God is telling to John. And John is recording for us to study here today. The mark of the beast 
will be a substitute for obedience to God. In other words, if we are coming alongside of the beast, the uniting of church and state, we will think we are doing God's will using civil authority if we could just legislate right behavior. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody could go to church and so there was a national day of church? I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying that if everybody went to church, the world would be a better place. However, in Revelation 13, that happens only under the threat of a death penalty. And that is not the Christianity we know today. That is Christianity united with civil power becomes abusive and controlling and demanding. You see, the uniting of the beast is exactly the opposite of what people think it's going to be. It is substituting the Holy Spirit with civil power. You see, God empowered the church already with the word of God, his truth, with the testimony of Jesus Christ. And he then said, when I go away, I will send you my spirit to empower you. And that is the divine power God gifted the church. And when the church lets go of it and replaces it with civil power, it becomes a perverse thing. And it results always in every country, in every culture, in every nation, in religious persecution. May I say, pagan or Christian. And history has already unfolded the conflict of religious wars. Millions, 30 to 50 million people lost their lives when civil authority thought they spoke for God as the church. Moving ahead. Loyalty to God is defined by the first four commandments in Exodus 20. They define what a relationship with God looks like. They define what the worshipers of God will look like. And I want you to pay careful attention because this is an intense study. This is a message that is for the entire world to hear. We need to know this message before the beast comes into power. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a, the commandment, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. I'm going to show you how the beast twists and perverts that. So Revelation 13, 4, we studied, it says they worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast and they worshipped the beast. Who is they? Everyone whose name is not written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So when we talk about worshiping the beast, notice the first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. That means if the beast is being worshiped, he is being worshiped as a godlike figure. Notice the question in chapter 4, who is like, and verse 4, who is like the beast who is able to wage war with him? I'm going to tell you we will answer that in Revelation 19. So the question here is, those whose names are not written in the book of life will join in worship of the beast. They are the ones this message is directed towards when the beast power comes in to life. The second commandment that is broken in this story is in Exodus uh, 20 verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an idol or an image or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, and I'm jumping on now to verse 6, but showing loving kindness to thousands. This is what God is doing. The Lord your God is showing loving kindness to thousands and to those who love me and keep my commandments. Okay, now keep in mind the commandments were written in stone, symbolic of an eternal commandment that is enduring come what may. All right, now notice Revelation 13 verses 14 and 15. To make an image of the beast who had the wound of the, uh, of the sword and has come to life. You see, pagan Christian Rome made some major changes to Christianity by the 4th and the 5th century and on. Because pagans celebrated worshiping on the first day of the week, 
The emperor of Rome took and merged the Christian Sabbath with the pagan worship day, celebration day, back at that time. Now notice in verse 15, it was given to him, that is the dragon, to give birth to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So breathing life into this image, notice now the second commandment in Exodus 20 verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an idol or image or any likeness of what's in heaven above or the earth beneath. So this image is a likeness in which we will be called to worship. Reminiscent of Daniel chapter 2. Go back and read the story carefully. Okay? Third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Notice Revelation 13.5. There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemy. And the authority to act for 42 months was given to him. So we have in that 42 months, that 1,260 prophetic years, the evidence. And it says in verse 6, And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. So what we have is the church state beast power manifested in persecution and religious wars for the medieval period as the evidence. Now blasphemy means to claim to be equal to do what God does or to be equal with God to change the things of God. So I'm saying that we follow that church state merger back to the change to a pagan worship day and that's blasphemy to think you can change what God said should never be changed it's in stone it's unchangeable you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain to claim to be equal to God is blasphemy Revelation, listen carefully, it says in 13, there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given him and he opened his mouth in blasphemies to blaspheme his name, his temple, that is those who dwell in heaven. The claim to be equal of God as you know is blasphemy. This happened when Christian Rome changed the creation Sabbath Notice Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day. This is the only commandment, by the way, that you are called to remember. To keep it holy, for in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, and the sea. Now notice that is underlined. Pay attention to the underline, because that is going to be directly connected to Revelation here in just a few moments. And all that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he made it holy. So if God has instituted and sanctified this day and it is the seventh day, then to claim to have the ability to change it would be blasphemy. Today, the first day of the week is celebrated as Christian tradition, but its roots go back to a church-state merger creating this blasphemous change. And I will show you exactly in Revelation where the last message to go to the world is a call back to this day of worship. Now, if this is a correct interpretation of Revelation 13, will it be part of the final message to the world in 14? Now, I want you to watch for the language John uses for the final decision for humanity to make just before the Lord comes when the beast is manifested in all of its authority and power. Okay, we're going to look at 14. We're not going to go in detail over this because that's our next presentation. I just want you to listen. So here is verse 1. Then I looked and behold the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. So here's the seal of God. 
manifested on those who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Now, 14, verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of thunder, and the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. Uh, I just want you to understand that this is like the roar of thunder, but the sound of beautiful music. That, that's how I would perceive it. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased or redeemed from the earth. That's everyone who has accepted what Christ has done for them at the cross of Calvary. Notice verse 4. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, plural. Women, plural. For they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among men as firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. Isn't it wonderful to know that following the Lamb means you don't have to lie? Just make note of that. Verse 6, And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having the eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And all I want to say is that the gospel is so beautiful and simple that we are saved by a man named Jesus Christ by what he accomplished at the cross of Calvary. We are saved by Jesus and his gift to us. Are you a willing recipient is a fair question at this point in the conversation. Verse 7. Pay attention now to the underlying part. See if this sounds familiar. And he said with a loud voice. Now notice the, octave, the voice goes up several octaves. Fear God, and that does not mean to be trembling and afraid of him. It means the word fear in Old Testament and in New Testament is to hold God in awe and reverence. So it should say, and holding God in awe, give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. This judgment is good news. And then it continues, worship him. Now notice, we've been talking about worshiping the beast. But here it says, worship him. How do you know you worship him? How do you know you worship God? Notice the language. Who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea in red, and the springs of water? Why did I put that in red as I did the fourth commandment? in Exodus 20, because the language John is using is the identical language taken from Exodus 20, the Sabbath commandment. That's important. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy for in six days, here it is in red, the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea. Exodus 20, verse 11. Exactly the same language of John. In other words, John is taking the entire world back in the proclamation of the everlasting gospel of salvation by faith alone to worship the creator God, not the beast power. How do you know the difference? It says, in all that is in them, he made, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it. He made it holy. Exactly the same language. You cannot serve two masters, for you will either hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. Now, I love my Christian friends and I love my non-Christian friends. They're wonderful people. But I, I just want to say this. Be careful who you worship. 
if you think the political machine is going to be able to solve the unsolvable problems of the world, then there's no reason for the church to exist because she was empowered with the Spirit of God to minister to the broken hearts of this world. So it's either all in for Jesus and worship him as your creator God or it's all in for the beast and worship him on the day that he has chosen as tradition. And I'm not pointing towards a particular denomination here because it's plural women. I want to go back one here. Okay, one more. Ah. Uh, well, I got to go back even further. Verse 4 of 14, these are the ones who have not been defiled with women. Women represent the church. That is plural. This is a multitude of churches, not a particular denomination. Please pay careful attention to that. Now, let me get back to where I was. The book of Revelation reveals that we are called to know who it is we worship and how it is we worshiped. Do you worship the beast, merge, church, and state that is coming? Do you love politics and believe that we should legislate morality? Or do you love God, the creator God, and worship him on the only day he sanctified and the only day he invites you to come and meet with him? Because you see, the seventh day is the day God is resting to celebrate creation and he invites you into his presence to celebrate the power of creation to create in you a new heart and a new mind and a new soul. So the last picture that I have on the screen, uh, this is the Mammoth Ski Area in California. By the way, this is like August. This, this is the very last day for skiing and boarding at Mammoth. Uh, and there it is. If you get up close to your screen, you can actually see that there's a cable running across that big divide, that big saddle in the middle. And you can see the lift up on top there. Um, it's really amazing that the snow that year lasted that late in the season. Thank you, Sherry, for your awesome pictures. I hope that Mammoth is just a place that someday you hope to go see in the summertime, maybe even in the winter, and enjoy a beautiful day on that mountain. So again, I thank Sherry for her good work. Take and study what we have discussed carefully for yourself. Let the Holy Spirit lead you to conviction. Thank you for listening. Take care.